All right, guys. And it is all guys. Okay. Here we go. My name is Evan Patterson. I'm a special agent with the FBI. Um, I'm stationed over in Charleston, West Virginia. I've uh, been here about uh, a little over a year and a half, and I do cyber crimes and mostly on the computer intrusion side. We've got another guy that does the uh, child exploitation stuff. Um, and then I also do, I'm also the uh, Joint Terrorism Task Force Coordinator for the Southern District, so I do a lot of counterterrorism work as well. Um, we're going to talk about social networking today and kind of talk about uh, some things that you should and shouldn't be doing uh, when, when it comes to social networking. And then I'm, I've got a second presentation that I'll do about um, kind of when to call law enforcement and, and who to call and, um, you know, we'll, we'll kind of go through that later. But so social networks, what, what is a social network? Um, you know, you have the Coleman commercials. The original social network was when you're out, you know, with your buddies at a campsite, burning things in the fire pit, things like that. You got the physical social social networks, you know, you're talking about your family, your friends, your church group, your school, your coworkers, things like that. Those are social networks in a in a physical sense. And then you got the, the virtual stuff, the blogging, social networking sites, um, chat rooms, things like that. So here's some of the, the big ones here in the United States. Um, I actually have given a similar presentation before where I go through a lot of the international ones. Um, Facebook is, is the biggest by far worldwide, uh, but there are major social networks that are basically unknown here in the United States uh, that are very popular, have you know, 20 million plus users in places like China, Russia, Brazil. So it's, you know, from our perspective, these are kind of the, the big ones. But just be aware that there are other ones out there. Yes, sir? The, the social networks in other countries and other languages? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and uh, Facebook and, and some of these have other language um, interfaces. And, and obviously the, the people that are on them speak whatever language they speak. Um, and how's the interpretation of those sites going for you to be able to read them? Um, we tr it, it depends on exactly what it is. You know, a lot of times we use, you know, something simple like Google Translator. Um, and it's not perfect, but you can kind of get a gist for, you know, what's going on and what they're saying. Um, we actually have, obviously, a number of translators that if I, if I need something word for word translated so that I can actually understand it and, and know or, or present it in court, for instance, then we'll send it to an internal translator. Right. So. But your day-to-day -day work just using Google or... Uh, yeah, I mean, if, if I just if, if I don't deal with a lot of those sites on a day-to-day -day basis, um, there's a couple of sites that I deal with that are more on the classified side that I can't really get into. But um, on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm not generally dealing with a lot of the social networking sites in other countries. I just want you to know that they're out there okay. and they're they're they do exist. So um, this is a, an interesting study that was completed recently talking about how people spend their times. I don't know if you can see that, but um, that's that's a course of a number over the course of a number of years using the internet has increased exponentially basically. I mean it, it, and, and a lot of people there's another report that I don't have on here that's talking about um, how people use their iPads and it was something like sixty percent of the time people are using their iPads sitting in front of the T V. So they've got the TV on, and they're watching TV, and they're also playing on their iPad or their iPhone in front of them. So my point being, social networking, and, and a lot of times they're, they're spending time on social networking sites, Facebook obviously being the biggest one here. They're you know, catching up with their friends, they're posting pictures, things like that. So this is, you know, gonna, this is gonna be something that you have to deal with at some point in the future. If you do any kind of investigations, if you're involved in any way, Social networking isn't going anywhere. People are using it. You need to be aware of the things that you can get from it if you're some if you're an investigator, and the things you need to protect yourself from if, if you're just using it as a kind of a personal user. So here's a couple of things that we're going to talk about, um, specifically having to do with social networking: malware, clickjacking, Nigerian scams, and um, cyber stalking. And we're, we're going to focus mostly on the last one. And, and I think the biggest key. You know, I, I talked about the physical social networks at the beginning. Most of this stuff is not new. It's not enabled in, a, in, in, you know, it's not created because people are using social networking sites. 
makes it a lot easier in some cases to do some things that you've seen before. But it's not, you know, it, it's not like somebody has completely reinvented the wheel and they're they're doing new crimes. There's there's a little bit of that, but the vast majority of it, of, of the crimes that we see is stuff that happened before, and now it's just kind of migrated to social networking sites. We'll talk about all this. Malware. Malware's been around since you know the 1970s, basically, with the you know very first virus. When I talk about malware, we're talking about not just you know simple viruses, but you know you're talking about uh, software that doesn't you know Trojan horses and um, uh, fake antivirus and you know things like that. Any kind of malicious software. And there's a you know obviously a variety of methods that you can get uh, malware, and specifically from social networking sites. The, the easiest probably, um, drive-by download, you go to the site, the site's been infected with a malicious advertisement, and um, you know, fortunately we're moving away from this where the browsers just let anything run by default. Um, they're, they're getting a little bit more security, but depending on how you have your browser settings set up, basically just browsing to an infected site can get you infected with malware. Um, you know, and, and with obviously Facebook being free, you know, a lot of most of the websites on the internet are free. They're all supported. You know, nothing in the world is free, right? They're supported by ads. So the ad network that they use, depending on what they use, they're the ones that are you know theoretically responsible for um, basically making sure that the ads aren't malicious. And obviously, if they don't do their job or they don't know what they're doing your site gets uploaded with a malicious advertisement. They're not going to know it's that ad network. They're going to know they got infected by going to Facebook. Although, frankly, most people aren't going to know where they got infected, just that they are. Um, you can get uh, malicious JavaScript apps. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about some some of the Facebook uh, apps and plugins and, and spam and things like that to go through there. And then a, a hacked app or, or a malicious app itself on Facebook. You know, you have Farmville and Cityville and Empires and Allies and all these games that are on Facebook, people play them, you'd be shocked at the amount of time that people spend playing these games. Um, you know, hours upon hours over the course of weeks and months spent playing, you know, farming, basically, you know, harvesting their fake digital berries or wheat or apples, whatever it is. I mean, they, they literally spend hours just sitting there clicking over and over. Um, but obviously, if you if you were to able to either create a malicious app that Facebook posts it allows on its site, or if you're able to hack a, a, a legitimate app and insert some sort of code that you know a lot of them will require you to download something to play this app. Um, you know, if they download it and run it, obviously you've got um, you've got control of their computer, and then you know any kind of PDF files. I don't know why. I guess probably because it's easy. People pick on PDF files, but you can do a lot of damage with a with some sort of uh, malicious PDF file, so just be aware of that if you get one in an email that you're not expecting. This is a real-world example of uh, Farmtown, which is a Farmville, I don't, I don't want to say ripoff, but competitor, let's say, um, that they actually had, it was there, they, they were serving malicious ads on an app on Facebook, and so, you know, this isn't like theoretical stuff we're talking about. This is stuff actually happens in the real world, and you know, you need to be aware of it. Shortening. Um, Twitter has, you know, because it's 140 characters, you have to. Every character is important, I guess, and so instead of putting a New York a link to a New York Times article that's, you know, 40 characters long, then you only have 100 characters to explain it. You have these websites that will shorten the URL for you. So Bitly is probably the most popular. So you'll see www.bit.ly/slash and then some random series of letters and numbers. And that's a, a basically just a, it, you, it redirects you to the actual site. So you don't have to have the whole long site in there. So if you look at these, I don't know if you guys can see those, but over here these are shortened. Uh, websites and you don't know where that goes. That could go anywhere. You click on it and it's going to redirect you to a site, but without knowing where it's going in the first place, basically clicking on something. And, and especially if you're talking about from Twitter, 
you know, maybe you know this person, maybe you don't, maybe you're following them because they're, you know, they talk about interesting things or stuff like that, and, and you know, frankly, from what we've seen, you, your Twitter account can get hacked, and so it may not even be the person that you think it is posting this shortened URL. So you just need to be careful about what you're clicking on, where you're going, um, things like that. It's, it's impossible to know. It's difficult to know where those those places will take you, where those shortened URLs will take you. Click jacking. Um, for any of you that are on Facebook regularly, you see the videos and the... Um, uh, basically, it's spam links in people's video feeds or, or people's news feeds where they've clicked on something and um, they it, it basically you know it's something supposed to be funny or like the Osama bin Laden uh, there you know supposedly the dead photos of Osama bin Laden that was a big one right around the when when we killed him. Um, you know, it was saying, click here to see the pictures that President Obama isn't releasing or whatever. You click on it, and some of them actually downloaded uh, different, uh, different sorts of malware to your computer. Other uh, Others just basically reposted it in your feed. Um, and basically the way that this works, it's actually pretty cool. Um, when you pull it up, I don't think I've got this on here. Um, when you pull up the, like there, there was one that was talking about a guy that got denied for his passport and click to see why he got denied. And if you clicked on it, basically no matter where you clicked, wherever your mouse went, there was a hidden JavaScript like button following your mouse around. So no matter where you clicked on that page, you were clicking the like button, even though you didn't realize that's what you were clicking because it was hidden. So that once you like something, that puts it back in your news feed and the process repeats itself. So all of your friends see it and go, oh, this is funny. Evan saw this and, and wants to... You know, wants me to see it, I click on it, spreads to my news feed. Those are spam, they're, you know, something you have to deal with, not really all that malicious. The malicious ones are like the Osama Bin Laden one, where um, it actually did download malware when you click to see the dead photo of them. Um, that's actually a screenshot of what it looked like without the, um, obviously they blocked out whoever's page that was on, but... <clears throat> This is, again, you know, when, when Facebook was set to announce that uh, they were integrating Skype and video calling directly into Facebook, um, it spams, that's, that's the, you know, spamming your, your news feed where, you know, for instance, the apps that get in there, if you have any friends that play Farmville and all these different places, they're always posting crap about, hey, help me with my sheep or, you know, give me a new t tractor or whatever it is. That's basically spamming your news feed, Okay. So that's what this one did is, you know, it, it was offering you the uh, ability to get a jump start on Facebook announcing video calling. It wasn't really. You download an app, it installs a virus on your computer, puts it in your news feed, and spams everybody else. So. Google Plus just came out, invite only. The scam artist took advantage of that and said, hey, click here to get your free Google Plus invite. Um, obviously, once again, not real. Um, and I don't remember if this one. Yeah, it's, it downloads another third party application and infects your computer. Everything old is new again, right? Everything that has happened in the past, whether through the mail, through phone calls, same thing can happen on Facebook. The, the difference here. If you get a call or, or a piece of mail from, like, for instance, my parents were up here um, a couple weeks ago. When they got back, they had a piece of mail supposedly from uh, Mubarak's second son saying, you know, country's in turmoil. Uh, I want to get this million dollars out. You know, if you just send me a little bit of money, we can get all this money to you and to your bank account. Obviously, that's a scam. Um, but this is a little bit different where it's like one of your friends. So, so one of your friends has their Facebook account hacked. And um, someone, they're called Nigerian scams for a reason, generally they're in Nigeria, um, is sitting in Nigeria chatting with people, chatting with friends. And so your friend IMs you and says, hey, can you loan me some money? And you're like, dude, no, I'm not loaning you money. It's like, I went to London. Again, I don't know why they always go to London, but... I got mugged in London, I lost my passport, I lost 
my driver's license, I lost all my cash. I just need like eight hundred dollars. If you can loan me eight hundred dollars, I can get you know go to the embassy, get a new passport, and fly back home. I'll pay you back as soon as I get home. Well, it's a little bit different when it's coming from somebody who's one of your friends than when it's coming from Mubarak's son. You're like, well, obviously my you know I didn't know my you know especially on Facebook. You have people on there that you haven't talked to in 10 years, but you're still friends with them, you know, and, and you want to help people out. Um, and, and frankly, the, the issue with this, I mean, obviously it's illegal and they're getting money, but if you send them money, they will keep asking. First it's, oh, I need $800 for a plane ticket. Then it's, oh, I need, you know, $1,500 for a new passport. And then it's, well, I had to hire a lawyer because my passport, and then I, I need another $2,500 for, for the lawyer. Then uh, when you stop sending money, they'll get the police, they'll get someone to either email you or call you and saying, this is Scotland Yard, um, your, your uh, friend has been put in jail, he needs bail money, why don't you send him, you know, $5,000. It just keeps going until you either A, run out of money, or B, stop sending money, um, you know, I guess kind of once they find a sucker, they bleed them dry kind of thing. Um, so, again, not necessarily new, but it takes on a new dimension. We're talking about this is one of your friends that supposedly is stuck somewhere and, and needs a little extra money. This is what we're going to focus on um, basically for the rest of this presentation, talking about cyber stalking and information online. Um, does anybody know what this is? That this picture is from? Everybody heard about that? These are from um, the riots in, I believe it was Canada, and this couple got in the middle of the street and started making out. Um, and there, obviously this picture was taken. This is a New York Times article about this process. But within, I think it was like 48 hours or 72 hours, the Internet had identified this couple. So this couple, I mean, this, this picture was posted on AP sites and, and, you know, in the news. And within 72 hours, even though this is a public place, they don't have name tags on, it's a riot, so nobody knows, you know, obviously people there are hoping people don't know they're there. But they were, the, the Internet was able to identify who these people were, groups like, uh, or, or websites like 4chan and places where people congregate. They were able to determine who those people were, and then you know they got interviewed by the news and all sorts of uh, stuff like that. My point is, if you're doing something on the on the internet that you want anonymity for, doing it on the internet is probably not the place to do it. Um, there's no anonymity on the internet anymore. Um, I especially think it's funny to call yourself anonymous and go hacking groups because you're still doing it on the internet and there are ways for you to be tracked. And we'll leave it at that. Um, this is open book, youropenbook.org. Uh, somebody wrote uh, a website basically to take advantage of Facebook's open API, which is their programming interface. And you can go and search any, any word that you want. You can search by gender, um, you can search by phrase, whatever you want, and put bring up status posts from anybody who does not have their Facebook privacy settings set to private. So if your profile is not set, is set to public, which it is by default unless you've gone in and changed it, it's a public profile, everything that you post can be pulled off on this website. And, and you, frankly, you can you know, search through Facebook and do it, but this is, gives you one place to search everybody's Facebook profile that's public and figure out, you know, for instance, in this case, I search privacy. One of the things I do, and you'll see this in a minute, I don't think I put it in this one, but uh, the other thing I like to do is search vacation, because people post when they're going on vacation, and you know they'll say, oh, either I'm going on vacation for a week, or I've been on vacation, or I'm on vacation, and wherever. And if you're on vacation, especially when you tell people you're in Aruba or out of the country, you're not at home. So if I know that you're, you know, on vacation somewhere, then I can go rob your house if I want to. Well, you know, Facebook does not have addresses necessarily. You can put your address in there, obviously, if you're crazy. But um, we'll show you how you can get somebody's address pretty easily. 
this is talking about checking in places, Go Wall, Foursquare, Facebook Places. Um, this is a, a website called RobMeNow.com. Um, it's the same thing as, as the YourOpenBook.org. This takes um, Go Wall and Foursquare. When people check in different places on their phones and say, "Hey, I'm at the bar," or whatever. This is again just using their API to put in a list um, exactly you know, where these people are. And obviously, once again, if you're at the science labs in California and everybody knows you live in West Virginia, then you're probably not at home if you're checking in. And these are these are based on G the GPS chip in your phone, so they're relatively accurate. So especially if you live in West Virginia, you check in someplace that's in California, you got a pretty good idea that they're not going to be home at least for a couple of hours. Is that updated? Does that update itself? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you go to robmenow.com, you can just sit there and watch it. As soon as, you know, I don't know, it's every 30 seconds or whatever. It just scrolls through new people checking in. So on uh, Foursquare, when you check in places, you can be um, coined the mayor of that place. So if you go to Starbucks every, Starbucks every day, the same Starbucks, and you check in every day when you're there, you can become the mayor of that Starbucks. And I'm not really sure what that gets you, um, other than there have been some organizations, specifically Starbucks and, and some coffee shops, that if you ch if you become the mayor, you get discounts at their store. And obviously, it's a way for Foursquare to um, try to make some money and say, hey, you know, if you, you know, because obviously Foursquare, Guala, they're all free to use. But if you become the mayor and you use our product, Starbucks is going to give you a discount, and then Starbucks pays go all in Foursquare, some advertising fees and things like that. This is a website called whenwillibemayor.com. And this will, you can put in your uh, Foursquare username and password, and it will tell you how many more times you have to check in at that location until you become mayor. So it, ha it figures out whoever is the current mayor, they've checked in 60 times, you have to check in 61 times to become mayor. You have, you know, four more times to check in. The problem is that this isn't run by Foursquare, Gowalla, or anybody. This is run by some dude, or female, I don't know, who wrote this. It's, it's, a, you know, it's an app. I mean, it's a website, but it's basically an app to check that. So you're giving your username and password for your Gowalla account to who? I don't know. I don't know who's behind this website. But people are, you know, they, they want to know. You know, they want to get this information. They want to do this. They want to do that. And they're giving their information out. They're giving out usernames and passwords. They're giving out public information about where they are. And they don't think about the privacy implications behind this. So you're, you're you know, frankly, I wouldn't use GoWallet, Foursquare, Facebook Places personally just to begin with. But then if you are going to use those, those are relatively well-known companies, you know, et cetera. Then they go and find something like this that, once again, kind of appears to be associated because, you know, it's going to tell you, when you're going to become the mayor, but this is not legally associated with Foursquare in any way, shape, or form. They're just using uh, Foursquare's database, basically, to tell you when you're, you how many more times you have to check in. And you're giving them, once again, access to everywhere you've been, um, everywhere you've checked in, and, and frankly, if you check in, you know, we all have basic patterns. You know, if you go get coffee every morning, you're going to get coffee at the same place at the same time every morning. And the more information that I have about where you're checking in, when you're checking in, I can build a pattern and figure out where you are, you know, within some sort of reasonable um, error to know where you're going to be at what time. For somebody in law enforcement, you know, that concerns me. If somebody knows where I'm going to be at what time, that's a little bit of a problem. Um, obviously, I don't want people to know where any of my family members are at any time. And I would think that most people would say that about themselves and their own family members, even if you are in law enforcement. Frankly, I carry a gun wherever I go, so at least I've got one up on most people. But <clears throat> I can stalk you .com. Isn't it great that people just create these websites for us so you don't actually have to do any of the hard work. You just go to these websites and figure it out. Um, if you have a good chance to meet Larry, you really don't want him stalking you. I can stalk you .com. When you take pictures, depending on what type of device you take your pictures with, um, almost all smartphones 
Um, a lot of, frankly, new cameras nowadays have GPS chips in them. And in the metadata of the file, they put in the GPS coordinates about where that picture was taken. I can stalk you.com takes um, Flickr, photo sharing website, and once again puts uh, where the picture was taken and puts it on a map. So this girl right here, it actually put exactly what address she's at. Some of them actually just put the you know, GPS coordinates. This it actually resolved to a specific address so you know exactly where that picture was taken. Um, that picture is, I wouldn't say it's inappropriate, but I'm not going to show you the picture because it's kind of weird. I did a presentation just a couple days ago to uh, the young professionals of Huntington and showed them a picture of planking. You guys know what planking is, where you lay down on things, don't understand it, don't get it, but hey, it's all the rage. Uh, generally thought to have start, started in Australia, and literally it's you laying on something weird and you take a picture of it. That's planking. So I was actually doing, I was looking at this website and I was making this presentation, and I pulled this um, this website up and there was a, one from Houston. It was a picture from Houston. I'm, I, before I moved to Charleston, I lived in Houston, so I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. So I click on the picture and it's a uh, teenager planking on a horse. On a, in a residential neighborhood in Houston, Texas. That's strange enough as it is. Um, the other th strange thing about it is he's planking, so his face is right at the butt of the horse, which, frankly, I think would be more unpleasant than anything. And as I was looking at the picture, I was like, you know, that's kind of weird. This neighborhood looks a lot like the neighborhood that was uh, where I used to live. So I, I mapped it using this, this site on the map. It's about four blocks from where I used to live. Completely random. I just happened to go at this time when this kid posted this picture. The only reason I probably caught it was because I lived in a residential area, but there was one house that had like 20 acres, you know, that it wasn't in a neighborhood. It was there long before any of the neighborhoods were. And they kept horses there. And they would literally ride these horses up and down the middle of this main street. We had, you know, a street with uh, grass in the middle of it. And they would literally ride the horses up and down the middle of the street. And I always thought that was strange. This kid... I'm guessing is associated with that house in some way because he lives literally like four blocks from my old house. It's just it's just weird. There's so much information out there. Yes, sir. And, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the basic thing here is if you post stuff in real time, any of these sites can operate. If you don't post post stuff in real time somewhere, then they don't really have a Except where you were a week ago. True, and and I'll, I'll I'll talk to that to that a little bit in just a minute. Um, that's absolutely true. I mean, they, it's not going to show up at the site, but that Flickr photo is there, and the GPS data is there. And and basically, what you can do is you can go through somebody's photos, pull out all the data, and again, you can establish that pattern. Right. So um, you can say, okay, so you know, at this date, at this time, they were here. At this date, at this time, they were here. Two weeks later, he was back exactly at that same place at that same time. Sure. Um, and that's that's where, you know, for instance, you know, I have a Facebook account. Um, I post on it somewhat infrequently, but I do post on it, and and my wife has one as well. I do not. We do not talk about when we're going out of town. When we're out of town. We don't talk about, you know, hey, you know, like when we went back to San Antonio, that's where I'm, we're both from, they got great Mexican food. We don't talk about, oh, I'm having some great Mexican food right now in San Antonio, Texas. Um, when we get back, I'll let her post, you know, pictures and things like that from when we were there. But while we're gone, we don't, you know, before we're going, we don't say, hey, we're, going, we're coming to Texas in such and such a days. And I've got all my privacy settings set, I think, fairly well. Um... But anything you post out there is there, and I'll show you actually here in a little bit. Unfortunately, this isn't going to go over quite as well because the person's not here, but um, some of you might recognize him. Um, I actually went through and, and found somebody who I thought was going to be here, a uh, bunch of infor old information um, on a website that I think he's probably forgotten about. So, you know, just because you don't post it in real time doesn't mean that information isn't valuable. A trip like that would be 
Yeah, and actually, absolutely. You know, we don't we don't go necessarily at certain times. Um, you know, and but I just don't want people to know that I'm not at my house. Um, you know, and I'll show you a website here in a second that's frankly pretty scary, and there's not a whole lot that we can do about, it, especially for me being in law enforcement. You can put in a name and a uh, either a city or a, a city, and actually in this case, I just used a state, and you can pull up somebody's address. And I'm on there. You know, if you use Evan Patterson, Charleston, West Virginia, you, my address comes up. What I always tell people is I've got two dogs and a lot of guns, and my wife knows how to use them. So more power to you. But, on that yeah. Facebook thing, to take that a step farther, um, I don't even have a Facebook page. Mm-hmm. And uh, I got a call from a friend of mine as I'm on my way to my sister's house in Florida. Hey, you want to see your sister? What? What are you talking about? Yeah, your sister posted you're coming to see her. So, I don't even have a page, yep. but my sister told everybody what I'm doing. So, I'm like, thanks. And, and um, you know, you, you can, when you check in at Facebook places, you can tag other people. So, even, and, and you can set your privacy settings so that can't happen. But, if you don't have your privacy settings, you don't check in, but your friend tags you in that post. You might as well, you know, if anybody that's friends with them that's friends with you is going to know that you're there. So, you know, you got to check privacy settings and, you know, show your friends this or whatever, you know, try and freak people out. That's that's my whole goal with this, try to say, you know, this information's out there. There are risks in everything you do. When you get in a car, there's no guarantee that you're going to make it to wherever you're going. You get T-boned on the way. It's a risk you take by getting in the car. But there are unnecessary risks, risks like driving without your seatbelt that you take when you get in that car. And that's something that's up to you to say, no, I'm going to put my seatbelt on. There's risks online. They're out there. I bank online. That's a risk. I'm, I understand that. But there are also unnecessary risks that you take, like banking in a unsecured Wi-Fi hotspot. Not a good idea. That's, a, that's an unnecessary risk. You don't need to do that banking right there. Encrypt your wireless at home. Don't bank when you're at Starbucks or wherever you go. So there's there's the idea behind this presentation is to think about what you're doing online, not to never get online, never use your smartphone, whatever. But think about what you're doing and what could what are what are the potential consequences of that. LinkedIn. Who has a LinkedIn account? Professional social network. You know, uh, good for networking. Good for you know, getting another job, etc. Um, this is a girl, and, and this isn't specifically about LinkedIn, but this is talking about your job and social networking. So this is a, a lady who, um, she doesn't identify herself in this article, but um, she basically was posting on Twitter and blogging and Facebook and all this other stuff, and she would say things like, just had a great meeting with a client. She wouldn't mention the client. Um, she wouldn't mention any kind of what she thought was personal information, but she would say things like, she had a great meeting with a client. One of her coworkers took it to her boss and said, "Hey, look, you know, if if this client were to look at the timestamp on that post and say, I was with her right before that, she's talking about me here, they get upset, we could lose business." And she ended up leaving the company. She wasn't fired, uh, but she ended up leaving the company because she didn't like their their practices and their policies on the use of social media. Um, you know, LinkedIn and, and business things like that is, is one thing, and I'm going to go through why I think that's a little bit of a bad idea. But, um, you know, your use of, even your personal use of social networking can affect your job. You know, if you're, you know, MF and your boss on Facebook, one of your coworkers, print, you know, you piss off one of your coworkers and your coworker slides it under your boss's door, that's probably not going to look too good. Even though that's on your personal time from your personal computer, probably not going to be a very good good situation for you. So, you know, just kind of think, once again, think about what you're doing. LinkedIn. This is a LinkedIn account of um, somebody who lives here in West Virginia. Graduated from Marshall in uh, WB State. Um, it's somebody that a lot of you know. Um, like I said, they're not here. I was hoping he was here. I know he was here earlier this week, but... Um, He's not here right now. Um, and we're, I'm, I'm just going to use this as an example of the information that's out there, okay? So obviously I know this guy's name. Um, I, that's why I found him on LinkedIn. Public profile, we all know his name. Do what? Public profile. At the bottom. Oh, there it is. <laughs> He's right there. 
Anybody know? Yeah. yeah. I, I actually uh, made this slide bigger. I had that covered up at one point. I don't know. I forgot it. So Jim Weathersby, he's the uh, privacy officer, information security officer and privacy at uh, the State Office of Technology. I always hate when I do these things because I know I'm going to forget one. This is the first time I ever have that. Anyway. Um, this is his Facebook profile. Um, he actually has it relatively locked down. This is his public Facebook profile. He doesn't have a lot of information. You can't see his posts. Um, the only interesting thing is he lives in Charleston, West Virginia. Obviously, I already know that. Um, but if you were searching for him, you can figure that out from his Facebook profile. This is a picture of him. There's a list of his friends, and this is just his, um, you know, he has a, a specific link to his Facebook profile. Um, this is one of the interests that he is. I, I was gonna, if he was here, I was going to make fun of him because obviously he's a geek since he likes the Kingston SSD now. But anyway, that's their website. He this is, is um, <laughs> if you Google him, this is a, a state document on privacy.wb.gov. Lists him as a privacy officer and his uh, work number and his work email address here. What is this? Oh, this is. The aid site last year's, uh, he was a presenter here last year. So I found him on the aid site. That's his name and his, uh, some of his um, titles and stuff and then the, what he actually presented on last year. Once again, I'm on this site, obviously. Um, I actually, at the Huntington Young Professionals on uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, um, the girl that asked me to come speak uh, handed me this uh, sheet of paper that she printed off the internet and said, is this all right if I use this as an introduction? So I'm looking at it, and it's uh, an introduction that I had used that I'd sent to um, Jim Richards with the State Office of Technology when I spoke at the State Information Security Awareness Month. Tells, you know, where I graduated from, uh, what I do for a living, what kind of cases I've worked, and all this stuff. I had no idea it was out there. Um, but she evidently found it on the State Office of Technology website, and there's a video of me on there. I didn't know my. Uh, basically, a short version of my resume was on there, but anyway. So, you know, once again, there's certain risks you have to take. Yeah. Did you do a presentation at the security conference? Yeah, last that year in October. Yeah. Yep, I did. I'm doing one this year too. Wonderful. Um, so this is that website that I was talking about. People, pipl.com. Put in his name uh, and just West Virginia. I didn't even use Charleston. That's his address right there. I block out the number for you. Um, so now I know where he lives. And, and like I said, if you use my name in Charleston, West Virginia, you can pull up my address. You know, they pull it from public records, whether, and, and I don't even own the house. We're renting the house. So, you know, it pulls it from public records. I get a couple of magazine subscriptions. I'm sure, sure they sell my address to everybody and their dogs, you know, things like that. But, you know, right some, there, it's a map on address. Yeah, you can you can it, it'll pull it up for you on uh, Google Maps so you know exactly where you're going so you don't get lost. Oh, those are his phone numbers too. I don't know if you caught that. I'm not sure which one it is, but um, and I actually didn't put it in here. But there's a there's a website that'll uh, basically um, check what caller ID comes up. So if that number were to call you, it shows you what the caller ID would. So you don't actually even have to call it to figure out if which one of those is his. And I don't know. I think one of these is actually a Nitro address. I think it's one of his old ones, but you know. 727 St. Albans, uh, 768 uh, Spring Hill, South Charleston, 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 it took me an hour just to read half the crap on this page because of all the stuff, the colors and the black and the red and the lime green. I was, I got a headache after looking at this page for not very long. But this is his wife's MySpace page. Um, the blog posts have not been updated since 2008. The pictures have not been updated since 2010. I'm guessing that she probably hasn't been on it in you know at least a year, if not more. But I know his wife's name. Um, she's female. She's 31 years old. She lives in Charleston, West Virginia. This is a picture of him and his kids. So he's got, I know what his kids look like now. Um, there's some 
uh, blog posts over here. She's talking about she uh, one of uh, her stepdaughters, one of Jim's daughters, had a had a baby, so she's got a grandbaby now. I'm a 28 year old mother too, and list their names here. So now I've got pictures and names of her kids. Um, stepmother too, and she's got two more. Oh, and, and she lists uh, their ages is here as well. Um, she's got the two Jim's two daughters here. Uh, married to a wonderful man, lists his name. Obviously, you know, very lovey-dovey. I was really hoping he was here so I could embarrass him with this. But, um, you know, talks about where she lived. She was in Virginia. Um, you know, and, oh, and he's obviously clearly very handsome. So, clearly. Um, these are some of the pictures that are posted um, in her on her MySpace page once again. And I didn't even go through any of these, but you know, there's his, his kids again, and that's that's from May of 2010, so that's a little bit more recent photo than the probably the profile picture is. <clears throat> this is on one of the blog posts. Um, it's talking about they're going to New York City, and I think it's from 2008, 2007. I don't know what kind of car he drives now. So I've got, I know where he lives, I know what kind of car he drives, I got his phone number, I know his kids' names, I know his kids' ages, I know his wife's name, um, I know where he works, I know what he does. See the problem with all this information, I didn't have to drive by his house, I didn't have to call him on the phone, I didn't have to hack his Facebook account. All that information was publicly available on the internet. It took me maybe an hour to put all that together. Can all that information be gathered? Absolutely. That, that can be gathered not using the internet in any way, shape, or form. But it makes it a heck of a lot easier when I can sit at my desk and put that together in an hour instead of trying to find out where he works, following him home, getting his address that way. Then I've got a car. Then i got to, you know, see if I can call the school or, you know, somehow figure out his names of his kids, figure out how old they are, etc. An hour. Put it all together. Is it, is it, is it wrong? No. Nope. Am I going to use it maliciously? No. Might somebody else use that maliciously? You know? I mean, the, I think the odds are growing that, that that's going to happen. The only thing I would point out, if, if, if you're targeted by a hacker, this is the first thing you're going to do, and they're going to try to get your password based upon what they find out about your organization. <coughs> It's basically profile. Wife's names, kids' names, you know, on, pets' on, names, yeah. streets, exactly. Exactly. That's that's generally, unfortunately, what people use for their passwords. Um, you know, and, and you know, the other thing is is spear phishing. You know, if you if you you know, especially with LinkedIn, you know, if I know you're the CEO of a company, you know, I, I can tailor based on information that you or your spouse posts online, I can tailor an email that you're going to click on. And infect your computer, and I can own your box. This is Flickr again. Um, and this is—I I just kind of wanted to show you. This is the that GPS in in the uh, pictures. This is their map. And you can actually, you know, if you go to uh, Explore, I think on Flickr, you can pull up this map, and it'll show you where all the pictures have been taken. You can see here, the majority of the pictures have been taken in, in some major cities. Okay, so it doesn't look like anything's been taken. Anywhere here. If you zoom in a little bit, Charleston, West Virginia, you can see there's one in Huntington, there's a bunch over here, some up north, and right up there near Athens, with the GPS information in it, is a picture of these two kids. Um, this is actually, I actually blocked this out. This is their names right here. And all I did was I searched for kids on the map. I think that might be interesting to a child predator to know exactly where your kids live, where where those specific kids live. Possibly. It's just, you know, think about what you're posting. Think about, unfortunately, you know, make sure for your family you think about what you're posting, so what your spouse is posting, things like that. Well, that was what application in? Flickr. Oh, okay. My point, don't end up like this guy. Anybody know what that's a picture of? A Wang? It is. Whose Wang is it? Some senators? Oh. Representative Wiener. <laughs> His account was hacked. 
Well, it turned out that he actually just sent a public a, pri- a message that he meant to be private publicly, and that is a picture of his wang, as you so eloquently put it. Um, so I want to talk about a little bit about InfraGuard. Um, I know we got a couple of InfraGuard members. Um, I'm keep this brief. InfraGuard is the FBI's public-private partnership for infrastructure protection. What does that mean? I don't have any idea, but uh, basically what we do is, as a group, uh, I try to have three to four meetings a year. Um, I bring everybody together. I bring in either myself, I'll speak on a, a, on a specific topic, or I'll bring in, last, last meeting we had was at the West Virginia Intelligence Fusion Center, um, which I'm going to talk about in the next presentation. Um, and when we had the Critical Infrastructure Protection Task Force members come in, um, and I know uh, Troy took advantage of some of their services at his business, Basically, those guys will come in and do um, complete security uh, assessments from everything from the cyber stuff. They'll bring in somebody from U.S. CERT to do uh, a cyber assessment. Um, They'll do physical security, um, depending on whatever um, section of critical infrastructure you're a part of, they can do assessments based on that. Um, InfraGuard, it has a secure site um, from, for some of you who are into watching the hacker news, the InfraGuard main website was not the one that was hacked by uh, LulzSec. It was a chapter site. The West Virginia chapter doesn't have chapter sites specifically because of that reason. I don't want to be responsible for that. Um, but the secure site was not hacked into. It's still secure as far as we know. Um, but it's good. It's a good way for us to, you know, in this community, to know one another, see one another, one more place. We bring in speakers and things like that. The site has, uh, it doesn't have classified information, but it has sensitive information, information that we don't necessarily release to the public. It's got FBI and DHS intelligence bulletins on it. Um, I've got, we have a listserv that I moderate completely, so nobody can email to it without it going through me. Um, so, and I try not to abuse that. I, I hate getting, you know, 4,000 emails and people hitting reply all and stuff like that. That doesn't happen on our, on our listserv, so I send out information like the aid conference, like, you know, different trainings that are available, and obviously things about meetings or important information that I think um, we have. I've got uh, brochures on it uh, in my bag if anybody wants one. It's free to join. Um, we don't, and in our chapter, we don't actually even collect dues, so it's completely free to you guys. Is there any sort of, um, you know, in my case, I work in private industry, mm-hmm. so I'm not really doing critical infrastructure. You are critical infrastructure. Critical infrastructure isn't just public stuff. Um, there, critical infrastructure, there's 18 sectors. It's everything from uh, power companies, water companies, um, chemical companies, um, government buildings are considered a, a, a structure, public, large public um, buildings like malls and things like that. Um, and then commercial, and then there's like a whole sector, it's just commercial. Um, if, you know, for instance, if something were to happen um, to Charleston Town Center Mall, there would be a large economic impact to Charleston, West Virginia. So that's considered part of critical infrastructure. Um, so it's, you know, you don't, law enforcement is obviously welcome, but if you work, if you work for anybody, including yourself, you know, depending on who your clients are, you can probably fit into one of the sectors. So does the agency or the employee join this? Uh, it's, it's per person. Um, so you can have, you know, 100 people from one organization if you want to. Um, but we prefer, because, you know, like, I send, you know, if I send an email out, I'm going to send it to a specific person. Um, and, and, you know, at our meetings, um, if you hear about our meetings, most of our meetings are open. So um, feel free to come, but, you know, before you join. Um, but it's, it's you know, and, and you actually, to the secure site, there's actually a, a username and password. And so from our perspective, it's your responsibility. It's not the organization's responsibility. So I think that's it. Questions, comments, concerns, snide remarks, anything?